Say it home. 
God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace. Taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender. And now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves. But Jesus was asleep. And then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. But he said to them, why are you fearful? Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? And then he arose and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And so the men marveled, saying, who can this be, that even the winds and the waves obey him? The question of Jesus in their storm and in ours is, why are you afraid? At first we wonder if he's kidding, if he's teasing, if he's pulling a quick one. Kind of like one swimmer asking another, why are you wet? How could we not be afraid? But then Jesus does not smile. He's dead earnest. He really wants to know, why are you afraid? He's serious, and so are the men to whom Jesus is posing this question. Thanks to a Galilean storm, their dinner cruise across the Sea of Galilee has been turned into a white-knuckled plunge. Here's how Matthew remembered the trip. He said, Jesus got into a boat, and his followers went with him, and a great storm arose on the lake. Matthew doesn't just use any word here for storm. Just like in English, he had several options. He had words that would sound like our equivalent of, 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 of thundercloud or, or torrent or squall. 
But Matthew remembers the bouncing boat and the pouncing tempest. And so it's almost as if he pulls his Greek thesaurus down off the shelf and he runs his finger down until he lands on the right word and he says, ah, that's it. This is not a storm. This is a seismos, S-E-I-S-M-O-S. A great seismos. We use that word when we describe an earthquake. Seismologists study earthquakes. Seismographs measure them. And what Matthew remembered from that Galilean storm was the shaking of the boat and the shaking of the water and the shaking of the horizon. And surely he was shaking in his sandals as he remembered the storm. He only used that word two other times in his gospel. Once to describe the shaking of the earth at the crucifixion of Christ. Once to describe the shaking of the earth at the resurrection of Christ. Once to describe the forgiveness of sins and once to describe the defeat of death. And now he uses it to describe the way Christ can conquer our fears. Sudden fear. The older translation reads, suddenly a storm came upon the sea. Not all storms come suddenly, but some of them do. Some storms you can see coming from a distance, but then some storms just seem to jump up out of the grass like a lion and pounce on us. And Matthew seems surprised, for he writes, Jesus got into a boat and his followers went with him and a great seismos arose on the lake so that the waves covered the boat. You'd expect a happier consequence to following Jesus than a storm, wouldn't you? Jesus' followers got into the boat and a rainbow arched in the sky or happy doves flew over or the water was as smooth as glass But Matthew connects these two phrases as if to say, get on board with Christ and you might get soaked with Christ. And his not so subtle and not so popular reminder is that followers of Christ get afraid as well. They grow fearful. And that's because Christ's followers contract malaria, they bury children, they battle addictions, and as a result, they face fears. It's not the absence of storms that sets us apart. It's the one we discover in the storm. And here's what the disciples discovered and who they saw in the storm. Here's the line that you want to underline in Matthew chapter 8. Jesus was sleeping. Somewhere in the midst of the thunder and the screams of the disciples was the of Christ. He was sleeping. And this wasn't a cat nap. It wasn't just a slight siesta. He was sound asleep. Could you sleep during a kettle drum concert? Could you sleep in a wind tunnel? Could you snooze in a roller coaster in a loopity loop? Jesus is doing all three. And they wake him up. And Jesus lifts his head and he looks at the disciples and he looks at the storms and he asks an honest question. He says, why are you afraid? Any chance he's asking you the same question? Life comes with fears. It's a scary thing, this thing called life. It comes with fears. Fears of tomorrow. Fears of failure. Fears of economies. Fears of wars. Life comes with fears. And fear serves its purpose. Because of fear, we run out of burning buildings. Because of fear, we avoid bad habits. For fear of the law, we drive slower. For fear of punishment, we behave. And there's even a a wisdom that begins when we start to fear the Lord. So fear in and of itself serves a healthy purpose 
And fear in and of itself is not a sin. But mismanagement of fear can lead to sin. When we treat our fears with drunken binges or sullen moods or vice-like control, when we try to control the world that seems out of control, we exclude God and we subject ourselves to a position of fear, allowing anxiety to dominate us and define our lives. This is what Christ warns us against. More than any other command in Scripture, Jesus urges us, do not be afraid. Do not live in a state of fear. Do not place yourself in a position of fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. You see, the truth of the matter is fear will always knock on our door. But the truth of Christ is we don't have to open it. And when fear knocks on your door, don't invite it in for dinner. And for heaven's sake, don't invite it to spend the night. Fear will always fill the world, but it doesn't have to fill your heart. You really can fear less tomorrow than you do today. When I was six years old, my dad let me watch the movie Wolfman with the rest of the family. Boy, did he live to regret that decision. After the movie, I was convinced that Wolfman lived in our living room. And I was convinced that he lingered behind the couch awaiting his meal of six-year-old, freckle-faced, red-headed boys. And the fact that I believed that Wolfman was in our living room proved problematic because in order for me to get from our bedroom to the kitchen, I had to go through the living room. And my father had carefully taught me, when you wake up thirsty and you want a glass of water, don't wake me up, just walk into the kitchen and get it. But now all of a sudden I knew that Wolfman was in the living room. And I can vividly remember stopping on the threshold of the living room entrance several times, several nights in a row, thinking, I'm not going in there. And I would turn and I would go into my father's bedroom and I would wake him up. Just like Jesus, he was asleep in the storm and I would shake him. And he would open a sleepy eye and he would look at me and I'd say, Dad, I'm afraid. And he would say, what are you afraid of? And I'd tell him about Wolfman. And he would sigh and climb out of bed and say, all right. And I can remember grabbing a hold of his tank top t-shirt as he would walk right through the living room, no fear whatsoever. And I would stand in the kitchen next to my father drinking that glass of water and I would look at him and think, what kind of man is this? <laughs> Jesus awoke from the afternoon nap and he took one look at the storm and he rebuked it. Jesus got up and gave a command to the wind and the waves and it became completely calm he handled the great quaking with the great calming and the sea became as still as a frozen lake and the disciples were left wondering, what kind of man is this? Could it be that God views your fears the way my father viewed my wolfman angst? And could it be that all that stands between you and courage is a prayer to your heavenly Father.
Oh 